Grappler Baki and its multiple sequel mangas is surprisingly enough a story about Baki, a boy with one simple desire to beat his dad, the world's strongest creature, in a fight. And that to me is what the core of the story is all about. It's just about a father and a son, which is why of course the main saga ends with a showdown between the two, not as opponents though, but as merely a father and a son. So if you find yourself entertained at any point during the video, then consider liking, subscribing and ringing that bell. Oh, and quick disclaimer, because I get enough comments about it. If you think Baki is nothing more than people punching each other and it doesn't get any deeper than that, then that's a fine opinion to have and I completely respect it. I just would say this video probably isn't for you. But if you are open-minded enough to consider there might be a little more nuance to this series about people punching each other, then strap in and let's get on with the video. Baki, as we all know, is the son of Yujiro, fathered by the ogre as someone to possibly rival him in strength, not a successor, but a plaything. He is, in the most literal of terms, a tool, a very consistent bit of characterization for Baki across the series. When we are first introduced to Baki, it is as a young but talented kid, participating in a karate tournament and then in the underground arena. His motivations at this early part of the series aren't expressly clear. But even so, there is some fun things to pick out. Now, one of the biggest ideas present throughout the entire Baki series is mindset. In other words, why and how one fights. One of the clearest and most consistent ideas is that those who treat fighting as sports will lose to those who see it as just that, a fight. Be it in Chiharu vs. Ein Michael, with Yori, Muhammad Ali Jr., or so many other examples across the series, this idea is deeply rooted into the fighting philosophy of Baki. This is first shown at the start of the series in Baki vs. Suedo. Orochi tells Suedo that he will not beat Baki if he fights with evil intentions, the first instance of the importance of fighting just for the sake of fighting, which will become incredibly relevant by the tail end of the series. And we also get Baki mentioning how he tapes his wrists and ankles to protect his skin from bites, clarifying that stuff like this will not happen in a karate tournament another jab at sports fighting, and almost as if the rules of no biting, the restrictions of the sport, are just watering it down. This fight also introduces another long-running idea of natural versus artificial, with Suedo using a template, artificially increasing his toughness, letting the head and spine become one, and powering him up by 30%. Yet this backfires in the match, a clear statement on the series' views of artificial means to gain strength, with Baki his clear superior, commenting on how he doesn't need anything like that thanks to his perfect natural power. Because Suedo fought with Malice and with an artificial boost, and as such he was no match for Baki, presenting very clearly the idea that fighting with emotional motives and with artificial boosts is a bad thing and only a limit on one's true strength. However, Baki further makes a point that the rules are also a constraint, saying the only way to beat him, a grappler, is to punch him in the face, even if it's against the rules almost as if to say the rules prevent a true fight from taking place. Another thing of note is how Matobe calls this just a children's quarrel, as well that is very much what Baki is throughout the first part of the story, just a child. After the fight we also meet Kato and the four people he had left battered on the ground. This is the scene where Baki's good heart, another important part of who Baki is, is first demonstrated, with Baki tending to the unconscious people. Now although we could go through every single one of Baki's fights as he starts out in the underground arena, that would make this video a little too long, so the gist of it is that Baki comes into his element, fighting without rules, not for prize money, but just for the sake of fighting. However, his motive still remains elusive, all until a certain someone makes his appearance, his father, Hanma Yujiro. It would almost sound like an understatement to say Yujiro is the second most important character in the series, as in a way he is the story. As well, what is the main narrative of Baki through to the end of Son of Ogre? It is the story of Han Mabaki, our titular protagonist, coming of age. It is the story of his life, or well, his life mission to fight and defeat his father. Again, this is in very simple terms. And so it can be argued that Yujiro, Baki's father, was the one to create Baki. And yes, the word create here is very specifically chosen for reasons you will soon discover. So to reiterate, Yujiro created Baki, a perfect meal for him to enjoy, a tool for his quest for strength, a worthy rival. And since the story of Baki is about Baki coming to fight Yujiro as Yujiro planned, it's not incorrect to say that Yujiro was the one to lay out the story. So in some very clever writing from Itagaki, you can say that Yujiro created not just Baki the character and our protagonist, 
but also Baki, the manga series, since he was the one to orchestrate the events of the story by raising Baki up to fight him. He is the one to dictate the course of the story as if he himself is the one writing it, like he is some kind of god. And I think this is blatantly deliberate. Now god imagery around Yujiro is rampant across the series and he is commonly compared to both the judo christian god and the buddha. But the most important aspect of this betrayal, at least in my opinion, is the idea that god is everything. He is all good, but also all bad his actions cannot be defined in morality since he is the one to lay out said morality. What Yujiro says is the law. To us the reader Yujiro does some truly heinous things, but at the same time he's also the saviour for the weak. He cannot be so narrowly classed as good or bad because he is both and more. Yujiro is what I like to describe as the pinnacle. He is more human than any other. He expresses more greed, more joy and more rage than any other human alive. He is simultaneously the best of what we can be and the worst we can be. He is, as I said, a pinnacle and as such he stands atop the world. He is the strongest living creature and so he dictates every other creature as no one can stand against him. The world literally revolves around him as the only reason things occur is because he lets them. He isn't a literal divine being in the world of Baki but he still fills the same role as one who stands above everyone. No one can oppose him and as such he is as good as a literal god and also a literal devil. If he has a son for the sole purpose of making an opponent to fight, then that son has no choice but to become strong and be his opponent. It is not possible to go against his will. Baki then, in a similar way to his father, is portrayed as the son of God and an obvious metaphor being with Jesus. Jesus took on the sins of man to spare humanity from God's wrath and Baki took on the focus of his father to spare the rest of humanity from the wrath of the ogre. He becomes a sacrificial lamb to Yujiro's endless desire for strength. I mean, think about Yujiro's first appearance in the series. He comes out of nowhere, interrupting Baki's fight with Toba, because as the one to dictate it, he can push his way into his son's life at any time. And with a single finger knocks Baki out, showing us all how large a gap Baki still has to close. He proceeds to go on to fight Orochi and destroys him in a fight, killing him, demonstrating the difference between him and his son. I mean, as he says, defeat is when you die. And to make it even worse, whereas a father figure is meant to be a comfort in a young man's life, Yujiro instead became Baki's biggest danger, ripping away all paternal love that a young boy so desperately needs. Baki's whole life, his whole story, revolves around Yujiro. His life is dictated to him by his father. His reason to fight Yujiro at the start of the story wasn't even his own reason. A testament to just how much of a tool he really is. Not even fighting for his own reasons. But to fully understand this, we need to go back to the start of Baki's life. Baki was born for one purpose. His mother only conceived him as a gift to Yujiro. It was not done out of any form of motherly love or maternal instinct because Baki wasn't born the same way as a normal person, not raised like one, because to his mother, he wasn't one. This is why she kisses him on the lips, because he isn't a son to her, just at all. A way for her to reach Yujiro. She kisses him because in her mind, he is just an extension of Yujiro, a step on her path to finally reaching him. We are meant to be grossed out by how she treats her son to make us realize just how unnatural and not normal it is. Just how abnormal back his childhood, his very existence is. Much like how he is a tool for his father to get stronger, he is also a tool to his mother for her to get closer to Yujiro. He lacks paternal love from both sides and this kind of shows. The only time his father visited him was to train him in the same way his mother only ever showed him affection when he was training. They both wanted him to get stronger and so he associated getting stronger with being worthy of their love. All he ever knew was training and as such his whole life became training. It's all his life revolved around, to the point it became all that defined him. He never had a proper relationship growing up. He wasn't treated as a human nor taught to act like one. It's why throughout the series he finds he can only communicate through fighting. He just doesn't know how to communicate in a normal way. He wasn't raised to. He saw fighting as the only way to communicate because that's all his parents ever taught him. I mean, one of the first things we ever see Kozue say in the series is how Baki doesn't get talking to people. Fighting is all he knows, so it consumes every facet of his life. Because, well, as far as his parents ever told him, his only purpose was to fight. If he couldn't do that, then he was worthless. His mother tells him as such. 
If he can't give you Jura a challenge, then he can't accomplish the only thing he was born to do. That's the cruel reality of Baki's childhood, born only to fulfil what is essentially an impossible task. His mother brought him all the best training equipment and hired the best coaches, but none of it amounted to anything. Baki in the first burst of defiance went off to train in his own way, something which rapidly increased his strength far faster than any training he'd undergone up until that point. This could tie into how relying on equipment and artificial means was the wrong way to attain strength, but more importantly ties into Baki's growing drive. He chose to do it off his own volition, quite an important point when you remember he had been doing all this training up until this point because his parents told him to. Up until his first fight with Yujiro, we see him for the first time become free, doing things of his own choice even if it's ultimately in service to his parents' desires. We see him fight people from all walks of life. A sportsman, a yakuza, a soldier, an ape. And each taught Baki an important lesson and helped to solidify what will become Baki's own fighting philosophy. Yuri at first beats Baki despite being a boxer, what Baki calls just a sport and not a real Kempo, a comment on Baki's arrogance at the start of the series, a trait he very well inherited from his father. Yuria himself undergoes a bit of a character arc. He wanted to become the strongest boxer and considered himself a warrior, yet lost to Haniyama outside the ring. It made him understand being a warrior wasn't as simple as just being the best boxer, that he couldn't use being outside the ring as an excuse for his loss. It's why when he fights Baki before the first father-son fight, he uses a kick as he has grown past just being a boxer and instead advanced to a warrior. Obviously there's more to it, but this isn't a Yori video. What Yori teaches Baki though is that becoming arrogant in your strength will always lead to a rude awakening, but if you learn from those losses you can grow to surpass them. The Asher Ape once more demonstrates Baki's arrogance, but in a different way. He sought out to fight the ape for training to get stronger. He forced the fight onto the animal for his own selfish reasons, Yet through the fight he comes to understand that his will isn't more important than others, that just because he is the victor doesn't make him right. A nice contrast to Yujiro's own words about defeat. Baki simply abused an innocent animal. He repeated the crimes of his father who had killed the Yash ape's partner, showing how much the hand of blood runs through him and how he is still just walking along the path his father chose for him. However, unlike his father, he feels sympathy and regret for doing so, coming to understand the importance of others beyond himself. After fighting the Asher Ape, Baki cannot decide if he won or not. Why? Because he couldn't work out if he and the Ape had fought. As far as he was concerned, he had attacked a wild animal without provocation, and the beast had just defended itself. And considering how killing animals is used as a sign of strength at many points in the series, be it bears, lions or tigers, this shows how different Baki is from the rest of the fighters in the series. Or more specifically, how different he is from his father, the man who killed the polar bear, the world's largest land carnivore, and well, as said, Yujiro literally defines what strength is. In the Baki world, to kill animals is to prove you are strong, but Baki rejects this idea, hence why he not only spares the Yashar ape, but apologises to him. Haniyama is another of these early antagonists and one of the most important when it comes to Baki's development. Haniyama is basically just Baki, but better. Both were young kids from powerful family lines, both pursuing the weight of their family, though one does so willingly and the other forced to as a tool. Baki at the start of the flashback arc fails to defeat 100 men, only defeating a mere 37, whereas Haniyama defeated 50 armed men and was stated to be able to beat 100. Whereas Yuri dealt Baki his first loss, Haniyama crushed him without issue. He is just Baki's better in all aspects. And this is very much intentional. How Haniyama differs though is in his actions. He doesn't just beat his opponents, he crushes them. Even when they are down, he shows no mercy. He is called inhuman, called one who transcends martial arts. All things that we ascribe to one other man, to Yujiro. Haniyama acted as a stand-in for Yujiro, to demonstrate to Baki the kind of man he must defeat. And although I'm not too sure if this is intentional, considering how Yujiro is framed in the first half of the series, but the fact Haniyama is so cruel, yet is later framed as pure and a good man, may be foreshadowing for the same revelation about Yujiro, that even if he is seen as sadistic and cruel, he is without a doubt the most pure embodiment of strength, much like how Haniyama comes to be seen in the series as the purest of fighters. 
Baki vs Haniyama happens without a starting bell. Unlike Yuri or the Yasha Ape, this wasn't a match. He didn't come to challenge. No, this was a brawl, anytime, anywhere. It was in that way, a far purer fight. It's not a fight that ends when Mob Man goes down, it is not a match. If your fingers are broken, you punch anyway. It is that kind of fight. Baki does triumph in the end, but a mutual understanding occurs by the end, as that is what Baki does. He forms connections through fighting, he communicates with his fists and gains meaningful things from them. Which is why as the fight concludes, the antithesis to that philosophy arrives. Yujiro, one who doesn't build through fighting, but destroys. He takes down Haniyama just as Baki just did, but the difference in their approaches is all too clear. Along with showing the differences between the two, this interaction also demonstrates how Baki is still under his father's thumb, not free in the slightest of senses, as even if he accomplishes something, makes a connection, his father will just come along, do it for himself, and then crush that connection underfoot. Another thing to focus on is how with his arrival, Yuzuro comes to the conclusion, their fight isn't over. The reason being that Baki hadn't broken all 10 of Haniyama's fingers. It goes back to his previous statement on defeat. All in all, he calls the whole experience a waste of time, because Yuzuro didn't see any value in that fight. Even though this was probably up until this point, one of the most important pieces of development Baki has gotten. Though that's development as a person, not as a tool. Hence why Yujiro sees it as pointless. After this fight, we see Yujiro's disappointment in Baki, taking it out on Emi for giving him such a soft child. And well, does Emi defend her child? Nope. She instead defends her methods. She isn't at fault. Baki is. We just saw firsthand how little Yujiro cares for Baki, and now we see the same mindset from his mother too. Yet your parents don't have to be your only family, which is why Baki explains to his mother that through fighting he has formed new bonds with Yuri, with the Asha Ape, and with Haniyama. He's starting to take the first steps to being free of his chains, yet as always, Yujiro is still in control, showing up with the head of his friend, the Asha Ape. Yujiro, after all, will always stand in the way of what Baki wants. To become free and his own person is to mature into an adult. And to do that, he must overcome his father. A child cannot be controlled forever, but as we will soon see, this is still a little out of reach. Oh, and side note, when Yujiro comes to deliver the Asha Ape's head to Baki, we see Baki training by stopping birds from taking off from his arm. Yet there is no violence here, no ill intent, something immediately contrasted by the arrival of Yujiro, with all the birds immediately flying away in fright. It's just little things like this that shows to me just how much care Itagaki puts into his symbolism, even as early on as this in the series. And well, back on track, the reason Yujiro does this is to egg Baki on. He declares when and where their fight will happen, and uses this cruel act as motivation for Baki. Yujiro only cares about the results, he doesn't care how he has to do it. Something cool to notice is that this provocation goes against what Baki learnt in his previous fight. That a true fight doesn't have a set time or place, it can happen anywhere. This is foreshadowing for not only how this coming fight is no fight and just in all honesty a massacre, but also to show how their final father-son fight is one that happens in the moment. And well, I don't know if it's intentional, but much like the Haniyama fight, it happens atop of a skyscraper and involves entering slash exiting through a glass window, just a thought. Baki finding resolve in the death of his friend eats the Asher Ape's teeth, a sign he's going to take on the strength of his friend. A pretty blatant example of the idea that connection with others brings power. In order to further train for this fight, Baki takes this lesson on, fighting in the furthest thing from a ring, the battlefield. Baki up until this point has been retracing a lot of his father's own steps, be it fighting a great ape or now fighting soldiers. It's proof that even if his methods and intentions are different, he is still walking down the same destined path. During his time in Hokkaido, Baki begins to learn how to best use his brain in a fight, mastering the use of endorphins and other chemicals produced by the brain. Although for now it's not too important, trust me, Baki's use of his brain will become one of his greatest strengths in his eventual triumph over the ogre. We also get Gaia's statement on how training muscles to be big is flawed, which although not proven to be correct, does also act as nice foreshadowing for Baki vs Yujiro, given the before mentioned brain stuff Baki gets up to, but I'll leave you in suspense for what exactly I mean by all that. The point is that Baki defeats the soldiers and in specific Gaia. Gaia being named after the F itself, he is an environmental fighter, one who uses everything at his disposal. He uses even Baki's own body against him. So Baki must learn to trust in his own body, he must trust in himself. 
In other words, he needs to start seeing himself as a person and not just as a tool. He trusts in all the effort he put into his life up until this point. Which is also why as he dies and his life flashes before his eyes, alongside his father, the man who dictated it, he also saw the faces of his friends, the people he formed connections with. And it's these memories that give him the strength to even overcome death, saying that some people don't accept defeat even in death, a clear defiance of his father's words. In the end he won because of the effort and connections he'd already put in. Being the ogre son was not what gained him victory, which is why him being Yujiro's son gets brought up so much in this fight, because he has to prove to the soldiers and to himself that he is more than just that, that his power comes not just from the hand of blood running through his veins. He doesn't hold malice for the soldiers and instead shares a meal with them, as he now understands where his own strength comes from, and it's from others. He says he will never forget them because even if they try to kill him, it's through those experiences that he grew strong. And although in hindsight the gap in power between Gaia and Yujiro seems like nothing more than insane power creep, it does actually signify something very cool. As well, the story is about Baki and how he experiences the world. We were led to believe that Gaia was almost on par with Yujiro, as was Baki. And so when we see how monstrously strong Yujiro is, a world away from Gaia, we get to learn this at the same time as Baki. Both Baki and us the reader come to realise just how big the gap really is, far larger than we could ever have imagined. As the fight approaches we get scenes of both Baki and Yujiro testing themselves in similar ways, showing the parallels between them, yet it also starts to become clear that the gap may be bigger than we thought. Baki may have beat 5 soldiers but Yujiro goes on to beat 100 riot police, 100 being the key number, linking back to Baki's goal of beating 100 men. Before we get to the fight though, we get one of the most important scenes in the entire series, where Baki is thrown to one of his all time lowest points. Emi finally realises how little she means to Yujiro, and so she takes her anger out on Baki. She blames it all on him. It's not her own fault, it's all his. Baki at this point is starting to feel confident in who he is and his life choices. That is what the fight with Gaia was all about. But now he is once more torn down. He knows she loves Yujiro more, he knows it deep down, but now he must admit to it. And so asks a horrific question. If I beat him, will you love me? It's ludicrous. Why should the son have to do an impossible task just to be loved by his mother? It's genuinely crazy. Even if he asks this question, it's clear how half assed it is. How desperate. Because he knows deep down that she only had love for Yujiro, and so none left for him. Even when he tries to hug her, she bites him, leaving a wound on his body. She outright rejects him, and what's more, others see. Others witness it, and so it ceases to just be in his mind. It's now a fact everyone can see, and with that he gives up. He walks through the city surrounded by hundreds of people who, unlike him, are loved. Even in this city full of people, he is alone. All until a friend comes to his side, because he may not be loved by his parents, but he made friends too. Haniyama, in my opinion, is, and always will be, Baki's greatest friend. Haniyama tells him that as long as his mother is still alive, he can still achieve his goal. Not to beat Yujiro, but to earn his mother's love. Haniyama himself lost his own mother, but he doesn't dwell on it, what he can't change. He focuses on what he can. He can't bring his mother back, like Baki can't beat Yujiro. So Baki instead needs to focus on what he can do, and that's to earn her affection. Haniyama, with a few simple words, does more for Baki than either of his parents have up until this point, and motivates Baki to fight for his own reasons for the very first time. And so as the first father-son fight approaches, what does Baki do? He invites his friends to come. He trains with them beforehand, with his true family. His connections behind him. Them being present is Baki showing his father what he has learnt, the power he has chosen to pursue. They are proof of the connections and lessons he had made. They are there to actively help him get stronger of their own volition. And always in contrast, Yujiro arrives with Gaia, a man he'd beaten into submission and brought along as nothing more than a broken toy. Something key to understand here though is that Baki isn't fighting to beat his father, nor his own love of fighting. It's all to try gain his mother's love. He just wanted to be loved as even if he had all these new friends by his side, He's still a boy, and all boys desire for the love of their mother. Yet as cruel as ever, when the fight starts, Emi stands not by her son's side, but by Yujiro's, 
as if he is a wall back he must overcome to get to her. But before it starts, an earthquake hits. Maybe it's the earth itself trying to intervene, but Yujiro silences it with one punch. Like how he defeated Gaia, the earth personified, he silences the planet's tremors. After all, the world revolves around Yujiro, he is God, and so not even the planet itself can oppose his will. If he wants to fight, then he will fight. Baki attacks and attacks, but Yujiro does not react. From the back, it even looks like a father with his son on his shoulders, but this is nothing so sweet, just a distorted and dark reflection of it, as this is no father and son. Yujiro, content with his son's growth, thanks the men gathered for raising him to be strong. This reveals the side of Yujiro we seldom see, the respect he shows, though it is of course still eclipsed by his sadism. Emi tells Baki to keep fighting, to make his father happy, but Baki refuses. He instead is going to fight to make her happy. But can he? Can he achieve this? As he is beaten into the ground with his face being caved in, can he truly make her happy? Well, the answer is yes. Because upon seeing the bloodied face of her child, Emi for the first time acts like a mother and fights Yujiro in his place. She tries to protect her son, risks her life to, and even if she died in the process, she finally got what she wanted, the love she wanted, the man she loved embraced her, she was fulfilled as a woman. But then even more importantly, she risked her life to save her sons. She died with Baki in her arms, with her son, her true love, in her arms. But did Baki, did he get what he really wanted, as he walked down the streets with his mother's corpse on his back? Can you really call that victory? Well, in Baki's own words later on, he says he does. That by seeing his mother try to save his own, he was shown clear as day that she loved him, and that love is what sustained him. He goes away for two years to train, spurred on by the memory of his mother, his reason to fight has changed once more. Now it's for revenge, to avenge the mother that finally showed him love, and defeat the father that took her from him. When he comes back, he joins the underground tournament, bringing us full circle back round to where the series starts, and then we go on to one of the most incredible tournaments in manga, the Maximum Tournament. The Maximum Tournament is the first time in the series that the story isn't dead set on Baki, and the start of the larger cast dynamic that persists over the rest of the story. Every fight is given attention, even those between characters who in the long run are forgettable and never appear again. But setting aside personal motivations and backgrounds, there is one thing that ties all these fighters together, and that is the desire to be the strongest. This simple desire, this drive is what separates a fighter from the everyday man. One way to look at it is that those who are seen as everyday men are the people who gave up on this dream. As the series itself says, every man has at least once thought about becoming the strongest. The fighters in the series are almost like children, dreamers who have yet to wake up and accept reality. If Yujiro the strongest creature represents the ultimate vision of masculinity, of what a man strives to be, then of course it makes sense all men at heart want to be the strongest. And so they fight to that end, using whatever means at their disposal, because this means more than anything. As Iron Michael says, this fight is more important than any world title. He will risk his reputation as the heavyweight champ for this. Baki's goal in this tournament, as he himself says, is to climb up to his father's level. This is in a way training to him, but at the same time also something he enjoys. It's why he brings Kozue to watch, because he wants to share his love of fighting with others, to use fighting, his only way of communicating, to build more connections. Now on the whole, Baki and Kozue's relationship is one of the most underrated parts of the series, and once again it's used to show the difference between Baki and Yujiro. Yujiro stole Emi from her husband, he used force to snatch her, he used force and abused his position as a man. As a personification of masculinity, it is only right in Yujiro's mind he can have whatever woman he chooses. Even though Emi did love him back, there is no question that if Yujiro wanted her to bear his child, then she would have. Now contrast this with Baki, who basically said to Kozue that if she found someone better, she has the right to leave him for them. That he cannot force her to be with him, that he cannot dictate to her. Yujiro by killing Emi's husband didn't give her a choice, but Baki gave Kozue free reign to pick Junior over him if that's what she wanted. It's the respect he shows her, that he shows others, that separates him from Yujiro. Much like Emi did with Yujiro, Kozue witnessed Baki's fighting prowess, 
but unlike Emmy, she was not attracted but disturbed. She didn't understand it, yet the crucial point is that she still chose to be with him. That she chose to get to know who Bucky was. She was once again given a choice. And as we go on into the series, Kozue's presence and her love for Bucky will serve an important role in him growing up to become the man he will become. Now throughout the Maximum Tournament, we see Bucky fight many opponents, though there's only a select few I want to focus on. First is not really a match, but a scuffle between Bucky and Katsumi. Now Katsumi is built up in the early parts of this arc as a rival to Bucky, also a son of a legendary fighter, he is very strong. Even being stated to have surpassed his father, making him in some ways a better version of Bucky. Yet he is arrogant and brash, a bit like Bucky was before he went to train on his own. Katsumi's treatment of the Yasha Ape Jr. mirrors Baki's own before coming to understand how wrong he had been. Katsumi represents a dark path Baki could have taken, and so also shows Baki how the actions he had taken were in the end correct. Nice to note how to keep up parallels, Katsumi gets taught the true purity of a fight by Haniyama as well, and then loses to Retsu, his better in every way, especially with how Karate is metaphorically the son of Chinese Kenpo, making this in a way a parallel of Baki's loss to Yujiro. Next is Baki's fight with Zulu. Now let's ignore how truly racist and abhorrent Zulu is for a moment, and accept that this guy with a very long you-know-what beat Baki. Baki wasn't ready, and so he lost. He was beginning to grow conceited in his strength as the champ, and so he forgot that a fight starts when it starts, not a moment later, nor a moment sooner. He was unprepared, and so he lost. Luckily for him though, Zulu attacked again and got kicked in the balls, but the point still stands that Baki had grown prideful and by doing so, had for a moment lost his way. He wasn't here for victory or fame after all, he was here to get strong enough, strong enough to fight his father. In his fight with Igari, he is tested in all manner of ways. Through trickery and deceit, Igari showed Baki just how far one will go. How merely pushing your body to its limits is not the ceiling when it comes to doing everything in your power. Igari sacrifices any shame or pride to achieve victory. He will get on his knees and beg. He will traumatize a kid with a lookalike of his dead mother, but it's all in the name of becoming the strongest. In this fight, we see Igari use the support of the crowd to control the match. He turns the fight into a pro wrestling match. He forced Baki to fight by his rules. Yet by the end of the match, Baki has done the reverse turning not just the crowd but even Agari's lover to his side, fighting Agari as a pro wrestler and winning all the same. And what did this ultimately lead to? Did Baki crush Igari's dreams by beating him? No, because Baki's fights always lead to something more productive. He isn't like his father, both he and Igari gained something important out of that fight and so both left satisfied. However, in Baki's semi-final match, we see a change in the boy. We see his Hanma blood begin to surface. The match after all starts with Baki entering the arena, the same way his old man did in his first appearance, and as Retsu pushes him further than any opponent before, his blood finally wakes up. Baki after all is his father's son, one destined to fight the path of the Hanma, and so to his horror, his Hanma blood pollutes his brain and he fights to kill. And then unlike in the last match where he finished the match having had fun and learnt a lesson, he simply stares down at his defeated opponent with arrogance. The crowd who in the previous match were on his side now instead cheered for Retsu, something had changed about Baki. He'd always been fighting for one reason or another, to reach his father, but now as he was getting closer to that goal he came to discover another hurdle, his own blood. He had to confront what it meant to be a Hanma, he has to come to understand his nature as Hanma Baki. Does he yearn to be the strongest just because he is a Hanma, because of his father, or does he do so for his own reasons? Before he thought he knew, but witnessing his own rage, Baki comes to question himself and so coming to understand what it means to be a Hanma, to understand his own blood, becomes the backdrop to the final match. Still, Baki did not kill Retsu, something that earns his father's disappointment. He may have given in to his nature, but that didn't override everything he'd learned up until this point and is evidence that he is more than just his nature. And so in the finals, Baki has to discover one key thing, what it means to be a Hanma which is why his only fitting opponent could be another who shares his blood. Jack Hanma is the half-brother of Baki, the first of the Ogre's offspring, but one that was not planned. He was a mistake not intended to be the rival Yujiro desired. This match is a test, pitting these two brothers against one another, a chance for them to prove their life and that all their life experiences up until this point was right, to prove they are worthy of facing their father, 
they must defeat their brother, proving that their way was right and their brother's was wrong. Could there be any greater test for Baki to show the fruits of all his actions up until this point than fighting his brother, a man with the same origins as him, with the same goal, but having attained strength in a completely opposite way? It goes without saying that Jack foils Baki. One is tall, the other short. One fights with precision and technique, the other a literal wild beast fighting with his teeth and being compared to a lion ready to pounce. Both share a body covered in scars, both are fighting to get revenge for their mothers, both are seeking strength to defeat their father. Yet one is defined by that revenge and the other is more than just revenge. Yet as we all know in the end, Baki triumphs and Jack loses. And while there is quite a few reasons for this, the big one and the saddest being that Jack isn't the rival Yujiro is looking for, not blessed with the same hand in the blood as Baki, unable to utilise the demon back, the symbol of their father. Yujiro himself says that his blood runs thin in Jack, although you could point to this being the result of how he was conceived, I'm not too convinced that is the reason. I think it is as simple as the fact that Yujiro didn't intend for him to be born. If Yujiro the symbol of strength represents God, then surely only the one he chooses is worthy of being his ultimate challenge. And that was Baki, not Jack. Jack is a failure in Yujiro's eyes, and that is why he basically represents every flaw a fighter can have in the series. Or in other words, all the flaws Yujiro would see in a fighter. The biggest one being that he isn't natural, his strength is gained by artificial means. The series even states he has walked away from God. Jack gave up tomorrow for the sake of today, that is the core of his fighting philosophy. It's why he fought Shibakawa, one who uses martial arts for self-defense, to live a long life. He challenges the notion of strength for survival, he undermines the very concept of martial arts. It's kind of fitting Baki's final opponent in this tournament, where people show how far they will go to attain strength, is one who literally gave up their future, gave up everything for this goal. Jack is the ultimate and most extreme example of one's drive to attain strength, one who will give up absolutely everything. But in a way, Jack is this idea taken to an extreme, but to an unrealistic one. After all, Jack's destroyed body, his muscles so weak they would be outclassed by a child's. They were the fruits of his own actions, he overtrained, he destroyed them in his endless pursuit of strength. Jack wasn't born weak, he made himself weak, his unhealthy drive literally made him weaker, the opposite of his goal, and his reliance on artificial means to gain strength only in the end destroyed his body more. After the match, after being dealt defeat, he still tried to fight Yujiro, being utterly crushed, because he refuses to accept defeat. It's lucky he survived at all given Yujiro's own view on defeat. Jack's drive is his biggest strength, but also his most limiting weakness, the thing that in the end led to his defeat at the hands of Baki. Because although Baki too trains beyond the limits of a normal human, something highlighted before the start of his match of Retsu, Baki also understands his body. Before the start of the finals, what does he do? He rests, more specifically on the lap of Kozway, representing the connections that keep him strong, the things he values beyond just victory. Seeing Baki before the match eat so much is also a great mirror of Jack's pre-match doping, the clear difference between a natural and artificial fighter, whereas one is happy and smiling, the other looks nothing but cold and distant, as that is what Jack's quest for revenge has led to. No happiness can be found in it, because it's based on nothing but anger, anger after all is all he has, he converted all his suffering into anger and drive and made that his creed. It's ironic in a way, he did all this to punish a father for hurting a woman and leaving a child to grow up in poverty and misery, yet as soon as he achieves his power for himself, he does the same, killing a mother polar bear as it flees, leaving its child orphaned and alone. He is just becoming what he hated, something which also foils Baki, the son who was actively trying not to retrace his father's footsteps. Jack's violence is played out more and more as we go through the tournament, his finishes becoming more and more violent and horrific with Baki's semi-final victory mirroring this too. Though, is this merely a result of their shared blood? Well, that's what this match comes to tell us. The fight is all about Hanma blood, about two brothers fighting for the admiration of their father, even if neither realised it. Like a lot of things in the series, it's a metaphor for a normal part of growing up, in this case, siblings fighting over the affection of their father. But given who their father is and how both men's lives have been defied by violence, it only makes sense such a normal family scuffle would escalate to this. The match ends with Baki using his demon back, the question of whether Baki is truly a handler like his father being answered. This tournament makes Baki accept who he is, by ending with definitive proof of his lineage. But more importantly, with him using his lineage to win the match, 
showing how he has taken his hand of blood, his father's power, and used it for his own means to claim victory for himself. It's one more sign of how far back he has strayed from his father on his quest for independence. No longer is he just chained down by his father's might, now he can wield that power for himself. This all being contrasted quite tragically by Jack, who instead pursued the wrong path. He never got the demon back because he rejected his nature, his natural body and blood. How can he expect to be the heir to the Hanma name if he doesn't even use his Hanma blood, replacing it with steroids instead? It's most poetically showed by Jack's own version of the demon back, the steroids in his body forcing his back to convulse and swell. It's a poor imitation of the real thing, but that is also what Jack is, an artificial and inferior Hanma, created by a scientist in an attempt to recreate what he saw one day in the Arctic Circle. Jack thought the drugs would make him strong, that it would fix his weak body, but even after all that, he still lost. To any normal person, this would indicate that the drugs aren't the fix required, but Jack has said is driven more than any other, and so he will never accept something isn't working. He will just do it more, in an endless quest for strength that he will never complete. Contrasted by Baki, the man who makes mistakes, who acknowledges them and tries another way. When the body alone isn't enough, he turned to his mind. When that wasn't enough, he turned to his imagination. Baki always looked for the next new way to gain strength, whereas Jack just did the same thing over and over, expecting a different result. In the current story, having now pursued Godo, we are seeing a change in Jack towards this more healthy mindset, but here in the Maximum Tournament, he personified the flaws of artificial strength, and so he lost to the real thing. He was ashamed of his existence, of the poor and miserable life he was given, so vowed revenge on Yujiro. He coped with his suffering by making anger and revenge his life goal. He let himself be defined by his father, much like Baki had once been. But Baki has formed connections, he has found stuff in his life beyond just Yujiro. He has found self-love, the thing Jack needed more than anything. Beating Yujiro is all Jack has. Despite his age, he is even more of a child than Baki. He more so than anyone else is a child dreaming of being the world's strongest. Yet beyond that, he doesn't have anything else and that's why he lost to the man, who made new connections as he fought, who learned from his opponents. Beautifully shown by how in the end he needs Jack's help to lift the belt, and later by how Baki says he doesn't want to be the world's strongest, as even this victory was not accomplished on his own, but the fruits of all his connections and actions. But more so than anything, Baki had a simple love for fighting. He wasn't just fighting for a goal to win, he was fighting for himself, and as we will later see, that is more powerful than any motivation. The simple desire to fight and to not win, but simply enjoy the moment. I mean, as Baki says in the fight, who cares about mummy or daddy? Just enjoy the fight. Baki, after all, understands what Jack doesn't. He can see past revenge. He sees fighting not as a means to accomplish something, but as the ends in itself. As it is that mindset that truly separates the strong from the weak and the real from the artificial. The scientist may have replicated the superhuman abilities of Yujiro, but that's all he accomplished, as Jack doesn't have the mindset of a Hanma, the pure love of fighting that makes one truly strong. I goddamn love the Maximum Tournament, with of course the exception of the father-son fight, this has to be the greatest arc in the series, one that so beautifully explores the lengths we will go in order to fight, spelling out the true reason to fight, while also developing Baki in such a masterful way, making him finally acknowledge and accept his Hanma blood. To prove that everything he has done up until now was right, and discover just who he is. A Hanma for sure, but also one modelled by his experiences. A combination that makes him strong enough to stand as the champion of the underground arena. Now as we go into New Grappler Baki, we get less of a focus on Baki himself. This is because as already said, the story begins to focus way more on the series' other characters. Before we only ever focused on characters to hype them up to fight Baki. But now they are having character arcs of their own. This might be why so many people disregard Baki's themes and messages, because on the whole, way more people started with the 2018 Baki anime than with the original anime or manga. And without the groundwork and character development set in Grappler Baki, it's understandable why you might view the events of the Death Row Inmates arc as nothing but dumb action, as you lack the context of Baki's personal journey. The narrative isn't driven by just Baki's quest for strength anymore, so the whole thing feels a little more aimless. This is also where the series really starts to dip its toes into the truly bizarre. On the Vogue by Son of Voga, we get a lot more focus on Baki and his character arc. The focus on other characters is still way more than it was back in the childhood saga. That of course isn't to say New Grappler Baki is bad, just that the way it tells the Baki story shifts a lot, and as such the themes of the story in this part are a lot more subtle, but of course not non-existent. So for that reason, this next section might be a little brief. The Death Row Inmates arc is all about defeat, which I explain in this video here, 
Though the idea of defeat in this arc never really becomes particularly relevant to Baki himself. Sure, he fights a couple of the inmates, but no meaningful development comes from these fights. And this arc for the first time in this series is one that's main focus isn't on developing Baki as a fighter or a person, but instead is about exploring the concept of defeat in the series as a whole. That said, there is still an underlying narrative in this arc in regard to Baki, and it's all about PP training. I goddamn love the concept of PP training. It's so absurd that it really fits with the more absurd tone the story takes post maximum tournament, but also so perfectly keeps up the idea of this story being one big metaphor for growing up. For those who don't know what PB training is, let me explain in a YouTube friendly way. Having intercourse makes you stronger. It's a simple and undeniable fact in Baki that post PB training Baki got a power boost. Though to say the simple act of getting laid is the reason for this power boost isn't exactly accurate. What having sex represents in the story is reaching towards adulthood, it is growing up into a man, it's leaving behind the mindset of a child. Through getting in bed with the woman he loves, we see a different side of Baki. The man who can fight armed men and wild beasts without fear is rendered a helpless puppy, a reminder that beneath all the scars and muscles, he is still just a boy with little experience in any form of love. That is why this act is so important. It's the love his parents never showed him, the love a boy needs to feel safe and to develop into a man. He compares it to fighting but then at the same time says it's different. Whereas in fighting you do what others don't want, in PB training you do what they want. He's only ever known communication through destruction, but now he is learning the other way, through pleasure and creation. He is stronger not because of the act itself, but because of what he gained from it. He now has something to protect. This act of pure passion deepened his relationship with Kozue and made him feel truly loved for the first time. To have his love reciprocated, he now has a lover to protect. He is no longer alone. Another great contrast to Yujiro, the man who stands alone. Another nice contrast being, how Baki, unlike his father, isn't doing it to get stronger to be a man, but because he wants to do it with Ko's way. Yes, he gained strength from it, but it's not in the way his father meant, not in a way his father could understand. After the act, we get a very important scene. When Baki goes to fight Yanagi, Ko's way says she will fight too. A mirror of the words Emi had said before. However, Baki is no longer a boy who needs to be protected by the woman he loves. This shows the change in him. He is now stepping into adulthood and so has but one last step to fully become an adult to beat his old man. The Right Eye Tournament arc is another arc that focuses a lot more on the series' extended cast, yet it still does feature an underlying arc for Baki. And that is Baki's changing view of his father. This is the arc where Baki's revenge starts to fade away, when he comes to realise what his mother gained through her death and that what he really was feeling wasn't anger but loneliness. What Baki deep down wanted and always has ever since being a child was a normal old parent-son relationship. It was the love of his mother he fought for before and now he is coming to realise he shares the same love for his father too. It's why he gets so angry in this arc when Yujiro not only backs away from Kaku but dodges. It's when both us the viewer and Baki himself realise just how much the young fighter admires his father. The reason Yujiro is the world's strongest creature is simple. Because isn't that what kids believe? That their fathers are the strongest. Baki takes pride in his father, he sees him as the image of power, so when he sees weakness, when he begins to see the humanity in his father beyond the symbol of strength, he gets frustrated. If his dad really has flaws, if he really is just a human, then why the hell is he such a bad father? He high fives his dad during the tournament because he admires him, because he wants his approval. It is within this arc that Baki comes to accept his true feelings for his old man. He accepts his father is a person and so he wants to get to know this person, to understand the man he admires so much, and to maybe, just maybe, form a bond with him as father and son. And this also happens to be the first arc when we start to see a different side to Yujiro. This obviously coinciding with Baki discovering his own feelings for his father. We see the respect he holds for people like Muhammad Ali, for Biscuit Oliver, for Kaio Kaku. We begin to understand there is more to Yujiro than what we, or more specifically what Baki, saw on the surface. The following arc is a personal favourite of mine, but one many seem to dislike, the Ali Jr arc. Where Ali Jr is really pushed to the forefront as a rival to Baki. Now from the start comparisons are made between these two, both are young prodigy fighters with legendary fathers in the fighting world, both are perfecting unique style, grappling for Baki and Ali style Kenpo for Ali Jr both like Kozue, and both have their eye on Yujiro. 
A bit like Jack, he is a test of all Baki's choices up until this point, and another hurdle to overcome before earning the right to fight his father. However, the biggest difference that sets these admittedly similar on the surface characters apart is their mindsets, as whereas Baki is a full-fledged fighter, Ali Jr. is not. It goes back to the maximum tournament, it's about the lengths a man will go in pursuit of their goals and strength, and this is where Junior fails, as he is not a true fighter. Sure he is strong and sure he can fight, but that doesn't qualify one to be a fighter. He is very much still an athlete, one pretending to be a fighter. This is exactly what his fights with Shibakawa, Dopo and Jack are all about. He beat Shibakawa in their first fight, but as pointed out by the master, when they go for a second round, that initial fight was more of a match. Ali Jr. may act like a fighter, but the way he fights is not. He is still an athlete, and so Shibakawa treated him as one. An athlete follows rules, they don't fight to the death. It isn't an everything goes situation. Shibakawa treats their second match as an actual fight, and treats Ali Jr. as not an athlete, but as a fighter, and hence Ali Jr. loses. Fighters fight, no matter their condition. Unlike athletes, they don't have a concept of best form. This is what his second fight with Dopo represents. A fighter will fight anyone no matter how weak or injured because that is what it means to step in the ring with a fighter. A fighter fights to win no matter what, fairness and rules do not apply to real fights, and if an opponent is injured, that's just an opening to exploit. Ali Jr. doesn't have the fighting mindset, he won't put everything on the line for the fight. He won't risk his own life and so that's why he's unable to defeat Jack, the man who gave up tomorrow to fight today. He keeps getting back up, he keeps asking for more, but he doesn't have the resolve to back up these proclamations and so instead of making a comeback from the brink of defeat, he just ends up more and more bloodied with each time he stands back up. Only when he's confronted with his own father as an opponent does Ali Jr. realise his mistake. He has been straddling the line sitting on the fence, fighting as an athlete but acting like a fighter. The reason he can go from losing to Jack to fighting Baki on somewhat equal grounds is because of this newfound understanding, as in Baki mindset is almost more important than training, something we already discussed with the PP training and Baki now having something to protect. Ali Jr in his fight with Baki finally fights like a fighter for the first time. This is why Dopo and Agari think Ali Jr will win the match because he genuinely has the physical might to match up to Baki, and now having seemingly gained a fighter's mindset he should be unstoppable. But still he loses. And why is that? Because he still doesn't get it right. Because even when he leans into the right mindset, he still can't go all the way. He is prepared for a death match the same way as a fighter is, but again only halfway. He is happy to kill Baki to fight his opponent to the death, but not at the cost of his own life. He will try take his opponent's life, but he won't risk his own. And because of that he loses, because he is no fighter. A fighter selfish enough to take someone's life but too scared to risk their own has no place in the arena and if not for his own father stepping in he would have paid for it with his life. So yeah, when viewed through this framework, Ali Jr serves as a lesson in what it means to be a true fighter in Baki. He is once again a test to show how far Baki has come, to show the choices he has made in life up until this point were the right ones by once again defeating a character that is similar to him in a lot of ways but also incredibly different in the ways that count. Both Baki and Ali Jr. wished for the respect of their fathers, the former by beating Yujiro and the latter by perfecting Muhammad Ali's self-made Kenpo. But the son is not just a tool for their father, they have to be their own people, their own men. And Ali Jr., although in a tragic manner, proves to his father through failing to live up to his expectations. He achieved what Baki has yet to, because even if Baki is the better fighter, in terms of being a more complete person, he falls short. And why is this? Because, well, even if he didn't gain the strength of Baki, Junior still had the love of his father. Whereas Baki, despite becoming the strongest living creature, never really got the loving relationship he always wanted. Ali Junior may have failed as a fighter, but that doesn't mean he as a person failed. Instead, he just came to realise his path was another one to walk. Again, showing how unlike Baki, he has been able to stray away from the preset path of his father, and become the individual he wanted to be, not just as Junior, but as Muhammad Ali in his own right. Ali Junior tried his best and by seeing this, his father came to understand that is all a father can ask of their son. Your son isn't you, they can't do what you did, they can and only do what they can do. And this is a lesson both Baki and Yudro have yet to learn, but it's a vitally important one between father and son. Hence why learning this lesson becomes so core to the series' most important fight. This arc rounds off new grappler Baki, 
a part of the story that concludes with Baki having evolved into a man and now only having one thing left to do, to fight and defeat his father, hence why the part ends with Yujiro accepting Baki's challenge. And importantly, we see how the two are preparing for the fight, one visualises his father and one is out fighting lions, which although seemingly unimportant, is just one of the many bits of symbolism throughout the story about the biggest difference between the two. Son of Ogre is all about this fight, it's about Baki levelling up in a way, not just in strength, but in his understanding of his father and what he wants to gain out of their relationship as father and son. It's why his first target is Oliver, not just someone close to Yujiro in strength, but also as a person. Oliver, after all, is one of Yujiro's closest friends, a bit like an uncle to Baki, hence why Baki consults him. It's a metaphor once again for childhood. The Unchained arc is all about freedom, what it means to be truly unchained, with Baki by the end of the arc showing Oliver the errors in his ways and how he wasn't actually free at all. He wasn't unchained. By overcoming the Unchained, Baki is metaphorically coming closer to breaking his own chains and becoming free of his father's shadow. A key point to bring up in this fight being how Oliver wanted to make a big show of their fight, which Baki looks down upon. A fight happens anywhere, at any time, to set a date makes it just a match. Baki shows why unlike Oliver he is a true fighter, because it's the fight itself he finds value in, not the wealth and fame that come as a result. Something mirrored in Yujiro and his reaction to the fame he attains later on in the series. This leads to Oliver admitting to his own fault, saying he wasn't a true fighter. Oliver being the strongest American also symbolically represents the country itself, showing how Baki much like his father has overcome the United States. Following on is the Pickle arc. I've made a whole video on this arc which you can watch up top, but in short this arc really hammers home this idea of the nature of a fight, with Pickle, the most ancient of human ancestors, being one who finds the greatest joy in life through fighting, but more specifically through the connections he forms with others through fighting. A testament to Baki's own way of thinking. Pickle's arc is a microcosm of Baki's journey up until this point, Pickle is like a child in a lot of ways, curious and growing up in an ever-expanding world. He starts as someone who fights for an end, learns the value of connection, he learns new things from the people he meets, finds pleasure in the underground arena, and eventually comes to fight against the mighty man, connecting with them as they fight, ending in a fight where both of them learn an important lesson. And so Pickle to Mirabaki comes to not see fighting as a means to an end anymore, but it being the end itself. With him going from fighting to eat and survive, to fighting for fun, mirroring Baki going from fighting to defeat his father, to him fighting to get to know his father. Their fight represents Pickle having a proper fight for the first time, a truly pure fight, it's why the victor isn't left as a definitive thing. Sure Pickle did win, but Baki engaged in the slugfest of his own volition, the point being that we aren't meant to be fixated on the winner, because this isn't a fight to decide a victor, it is a fight for just that, to be a fight. This fight is not only Pickle learning this lesson, but Baki internalising it himself. By choosing to not use his techniques and to fight Pickle in a brawl, he threw aside any thoughts of victory. Because such things had become pointless, something later reflected in his approach towards the father-son fight. No sorry, the simple family quarrel. Pickle is a microcosm of the entire story of Baki, which is why he is the penultimate opponent for Baki before he fights his father. This fight is the final test for Baki before he matures, confronting a person much like himself in the same way he did with Jack and Junior, which coincidentally happened to be his final fights of both Grappler Baki and New Grappler Baki. But more importantly, he fights someone stronger than him, because Pickle represents an opponent Baki cannot beat, because he is the final lesson that he doesn't need to beat his opponent, that he doesn't need to fixate on victory, which is foreshadowing for how he wins the father-son fight even without defeating Yujiro in a literal sense. Now we get to talk about one of the most important things in the entire series, and that's the demon brain. You know, that thing that appears in like one chapter, then never again? Yeah, that's the one. Let's think about it. What is the demon brain? It's Baki's own version of the demon back, his own signifier of personal strength. But why a brain? Or another way to look at it, why is Yujiro's a back? Yujiro, especially in Son of Ogre, is defined by his raw ability, his pure power. He is called an expert in physical force many times. Around the start of the father-son fight, aka when the demon brain is introduced. If Yujiro represents strength, then is it not fitting his trademark the demon back? It is a representation of what Yujiro sees as strength, aka insane physical ability, the ultimate show of brawn of brute strength. This then being contrasted by Baki's demon brain, 
Tabaki strength isn't about physical force or brawn, hence his own trademark is his brain. I mean, think about it, what is Baki's strongest attribute, the thing that ties all his strongest moves together? Imagination. Baki sees strength beyond the body, beyond just muscles, and his demon brain is the ultimate signifier of this. Think back to the start of Son of Ogre. While Yujiro is fighting a giant elephant, Baki fights an imaginary praying mantis. It is meant to show us how these two fighters differ in their views of strength. Yujiro downplays Baki's imagination training because it is not what he views as strength, it's counter to his belief in pure physical might. Hence why when he uses the technique for himself, all he can imagine is his own body. He is unable to understand this way of fighting, this new strength that goes against what he defines as strength. And well, let's just say the fight didn't end with a show of physical might. The demon brain is a new type of strength, one that is different from Yujiro. It goes against what God dictates, but well, can the God be God forever? That is what this fight is all about. But let's be honest, to call it a fight might not be the right wording. This fight is a reconciliation between father and son, a speedrun of 18 years of parenting. The reason this fight happens at this point in Baki's life being, because this is when the boy becomes a man. It is his final trial before becoming an adult. He must beat his dad and show him that he will not follow his father's path, that he isn't just a tool, that he can walk his own path and be his own person. By doing this, by defying his father's will, he also defies the will of the world's metaphorical god. One of the reasons why he earns the title of world's strongest creature is because he becomes the first creature to overcome the pinnacle. Not by punching hard on the new Jiro or beating him in a fist fight, but by defying his will and becoming his own man. That is why him flipping the imaginary table is so significant, because it is him flat out telling his father that he isn't a meal to be eaten. And well, that's not the only symbolism to this masterful scene, as when Baki calls Yujiro's miso soup salty, he is saying that Yujiro failed at something, that the food he cooked wasn't quite as it should be. Which is an obvious reference to himself, the meal that Yujiro could not eat, the one that didn't come out as intended. It's basically Baki calling Yujiro out on his failure, once again a clear defiance of the pinnacle and the reason he is worthy of being called the world's strongest creature. And well, who can forget the obvious subversion in having Baki the son flip the table, not Yujiro the father, proving Baki is now not a boy anymore, but a full-fledged man in his own right. And because this scene keeps getting deeper, we have the fact Yujiro is pulled into the fantasy. He not only admits that the soup is too salty, but goes to catch the imaginary bowls and chopsticks, and is such pulled into a fantasy that Baki created. And well, by doing so, he proves Yujiro is wrong. He makes the man who saw no value in imagination, who thought only the real thing mattered, give in to the fantasy. Baki's demon brain, his own vision of strength, surpassed Yujiro's demon back and his idea of physical force being almighty. It is the start of a paradigm shift that becomes one of the core focuses of Baki Do. Baki, by becoming the world's strongest creature, comes to redefine what strength in the world of Baki looks like. But that's a topic for a little later in the video. Now so far I have really emphasised the idea that Baki comes of age by defying Yujiro, but we can't forget that this fight also acts as a bonding experience for the two. Baki, as we have discussed, comes to respect and admire his father, and Yujiro likewise goes from seeing his son as just a meal, and an opponent, to a son. This is best illustrated in the dinner at Baki's place, and then the restaurant meal that precedes the fight. It is the two trying to show the other a piece of their own world. Yujiro imbues fatherly wisdom on his son, scolds him more so than anything else, acts like a dad should. Connection and understanding happens over a meal. We see it back with the soldiers, later with the sumos, and most importantly, at the end of the father-son fight. Through the appearance of Ghost Yujiro, we get to see a small glimpse of how Yujiro and his own father's relationship must have been. And well, it seems pretty similar to Baki and Yujiro's. The whole fight is just the two playing catch up, simulating the father and son life they missed for 18 years in the only way these two know how, by fighting. They found a common ground in fighting and so only when Baki is strong enough to fight Yujiro can they have a proper dialogue. Baki tries to breach this gap with the home cooked meal, but in the end it's only by fighting the two can truly communicate. This entire fight, this last supper if you will, is a microcosm of the entire narrative of a son's constant pursuit of his father's approval ending in him finally getting it and so growing up into a man and taking his own path. It's a perfect ending to the series in my opinion, a coming of age story that ends when our titular protagonist comes of age. And further to this, Baki Do is the perfect continuation, as what does Baki Do mean? It means the way of Baki, or the path of Baki. 
It's a series about the path back he will now walk as a man with his father's approval. This fight in short condenses down all of the series' most important messages. It's the idea of an ambitious boy, a dreamer who wants his father's praise taken to the extreme and of a father learning what it means to be a father. A boy growing up into a man is a journey of maturing and life experience and this is represented in Baki by the quest to get stronger, maturing as a fighter through new experiences. A boy must surpass their father and become a man themselves and the father must let their son grow up and realise that they have their own lives to live. Baki is a story about a father and a son and so of course the pinnacle of its storytelling comes from a quarrel between the two. A fight that leads to a mutual understanding and answers to both parties what it means to be a son and what it means to be a father. It's a deeply personal fight that so perfectly showcases a parent and a child and while the reason I think this is so true is because of the series' author. Itagaki stated after the conclusion of Son of Ogre in an interview that he saw himself in Yujiro because he too is a father, one with a child looking to surpass them. You may not know this but Itagaki's own daughter Paru is a mangaka too, a very good one given the masterpiece that is Beastars. Yujiro before Son of Ogre was a pretty stellar character but after it was God Tier, one of the best written antagonists I've ever seen. And I think the reason is that Itagaki stopped writing him as the ogre, but as a father. Authors, even if they don't mean to, write in their own life experiences. Take Lord of the Rings. Tolkien was always adamant that he never included allegories in his work, yet it's hard to deny how his personal beliefs on the environment and deforestation didn't affect the story. The forces of Mordor, evil incarnate, destroyed the forest to build evil weapons of war. It's easy to make the connection to what happened to Britain's own forests, to Tolkien's home, during the war. The forest ripped up to build ships for war. Even if we don't mean to, we will always incorporate our own beliefs into our works, and often it's because we feel so strongly about them that these beliefs result in the greatest of masterpieces. And God is Son of Ogre and the Father-Son Fight, a masterpiece. Still, it is not the end of the series, which is where Baki Do comes in. This part is all about one thing going further. It's about what comes next. With the defeat of the ogre and a new world's strongest, with strength now beginning to be defined by Baki, not Yujiro, how will the world change? That is what Baki Do explores. A cool thing to note is how both Musashi and Sukune, the two new challengers, both heavily rely not on brute force like the previous big challengers like Jack and Pickle, but instead on the use of imaginary techniques. This reflects how the world is now being defined by Baki's perception of strength rather than Yujiro's. But why are these challenges here? Because the world is bored. In a bit of out of story deconstruction, Bakido takes the absurdist ideas of jumping the shark and makes it the core idea. A dead man is forced to the modern day fighting against their will, all for the sake of having a new challenger for the fighters of the modern day to fight. He is a new shiny toy. A nice bit of foreshadowing being the samurai toy Baki makes during the father-son fight, since Musashi ends up becoming a toy to Baki as he grows bored and desires a stronger opponent to fight. Yet when he is brought back, he is nothing like people imagined, not the image of an enlightened sword saint as people saw him as. I explore this in my dedicated Musashi video, but all they do is bring back a man who, in the modern day, would be viewed as a monster. As punishment for their pursuit of more and more excitement of indulging in spectacle, the present is assaulted by Musashi, a demon of the past. They all imagined him, what it would be like to fight him, and so they take that imagination and make it reality. This is the danger of Baki's definition of strength. Their eyes were too big for their stomachs, their greed too large. It was not a meal that could be consumed, hence why Baki couldn't defeat Musashi, or the fight was cut short, because the modern day didn't deserve to eat the cake. When people looked at Musashi, they didn't see a person, they saw images of what he could be. They don't look at reality. It's why Haniyama of all people can see past these images. He sees nothing in a fight but a fight. No preconceptions or expectations. Unlike most of the cast who want something out of Musashi, they want a good fight, they want their boredom to be taken away. Another cool thing about these images, the characters see, is that Yujiro and Baki's differ with Baki ending up to be the correct one in the end, another example of the world shifting from Yujiro to Baki, also backed up by the story directly saying that Baki vs Musashi is a continuation of Yujiro vs Musashi. Musashi starts in Baki's mind as a nuke, a man-made disaster, but then shifts to a fresh cream palace, something to be devoured, a toy for his amusement, much like the toy he made in Son of Ogre. Musashi the Sword Saint was rendered to nothing but another quick thrill for a world in constant search of the next big fight. 
Musashi was called enlightened in his day, but his third eye is shattered by first Yujiro and then by Baki, because in the modern day the definition of such things has changed. Baki now defines such things, and his answer is simple, to fight for the simple sake of fighting, to enjoy it. As Baki Do continues, we see this idea continue to be explored, the image of an alien coming up fairly frequently, as what the world is seeking is something truly out of this world. From a sword saint to the god of sumo, Baki seeks more and more challenges for his own amusement, and by the end of Baki Do 2018, as he defeats Tsukade in under 10 seconds, we see Baki truly step into his role as the new god of the Baki world, defeating a self-proclaimed god in an instant. Like how the first Tsukune defeated the strongest man Keia, replacing the old with the new, Baki now has defeated Tsukune and stepped forward into the new era, one he defines. Baki no longer is the challenger, he is now the final boss, others must strive to defeat. Possibly why we have now shifted our focus to Jack, a challenger, who already is starting to mirror Baki's journey, fighting off against Shinogi, Baki's first ever opponent in the underground arena. I can only guess how the story will proceed from here, but one thing is for certain. Baki himself has become the world's strongest creature, and so no longer is this a story about him, dictated by somebody else. No, it's his own story, and the only one telling it is him, the son of the ogre, now the new world's strongest creature. Just a little after video thought I want to get off my chest, is that although yes I've spent like an hour talking about the underlying themes and messages of the story, I by no means am trying to imply those parts of the story that aren't metaphors or symbolism, or worse or pointless. It's honestly the sincerity the series treats its absurdity with that makes me admire it so much. Sure, Baki didn't need to pretend he was a triceratops to get across the message of the father-son fight, nor did he need to fight a praying mantis to show how his mindset contrasts to his father's. But things can be in a story just because they are fun. Baki is so amazing to me because it weaves in what many would call dumb mindless action with a compelling story. The story would suffer without the absurdity, that's an obvious truth. So for that reason, I'd hate for anyone to come away from this video thinking that you are wrong to enjoy the series, just for the action and the absurdity. All I wanted to get across is how masterfully the action and absurdity of the series can be used to tell such a personal and heartwarming story. As at least to me, this story really is, in all of manga, though maybe all of fiction, the greatest father-son story ever told. And for a real throwback, if you made it this far into the video, then comment Baki is a bloke in the comment section down below. If you're a real, real OG subscriber, you'll know what that means. And if you want to support this channel even further, then perhaps pledge to my Patreon or become a channel member so you can get your name at the end of the video, like Hikari Desu, Rinjak9696, General Tonyos, and Mr. Sputum. So with all that said and done, I've been Seth the Sin, the Deadly Sin of Geek, and I'm signing out. Stay safe, everyone.